Right, welcome. So uh, we have here the uh, tourism and events. Best friend all around, all right. Uh, and we have the urban and, and regional planning students. Uh, I'm Robin Crompton. I'm in charge of the uh, course leader for the urban and regional planning. And to my right, we have our vice chancellor, yeah. Dr. Peter Bonfield. And this is the first lecture he's given since arriving at the university. Mm. So uh, he's going to give you all the pearls of wisdom of working on the sustainability plan for the Olymp London Olympics, and some anecdotes, probably, hmm. if you ask him nice questions. He will, hopefully there'll be time for Q&A, but he's got to finish at one, and we've got to be out here at one. So, Peter, over to you. Okay, so, morning. Morning. So, now what are we? We're events and, what are the courses we've got here today? Events and events and Okay, and urban and regional planning. Urban and regional planning, okay. And international planning. And international planning as well. Okay. So the way we'll do this then, I'll, I'll, I want to tell you some stories about an experience I had that sort of embraces both those things in London at the Olympics. Uh, we'll talk about that a little, and then we will have a discussion session. So I'll allow about 15 minutes or so at the end for questions and things like that. And... Um, so as we go through, can be prepared at the end to ask questions and things. That'd be good. And this is, so I'm Vice Chancellor here. Um, I do a number of things, but one of the things that we'll all, we'll all meet again, hopefully, and we'll all meet again in the Royal Festival Hall in a July or November, and you'll be about where that radiator is, in a gown and a hat. There'll be a red carpet between you and I. <laughs> There'll be... 2,000 people in the Royal Festival Hall, and when you walk towards me, you'll be a graduand, and when you walk past me, you'll be a graduate or a postgraduate or wherever you are. So if I never see you again in your period here, I look forward to that moment, okay? And I'll be the one in a black and gold gown with a funny hat on, and part of one of my great uh, honours here as Vice-Chancellor is to confer degrees. But my job here is I'm like the chief executive. My job is to, to run the university. Um, it doesn't normally encompass giving lectures, but you do both cover topics that are close to my heart that I have some experiences on, and I wanted to share some of those with you. Um, and I hope I share them with you in a sort of practical, employability, international type of way. So the stories I tell you, it's not, it's not going to be very theoretical. It's more about the culture and the things you do and how you make something that's really scary idea become a reality and be a brilliant, one of the brilliant shows on earth, which was the London 2012 Olympics. Okay, so we do that. So my own role there was we won the Olympics against Paris and New York and various other places in about 2004. So you may or may not remember that. You're some look quite young. It was quite a long time ago, but we won it. And our team won it despite the odds. The expectation was that Britain wouldn't win it, but uh, everybody got behind it. We had Prince William behind it, we got Lord Sebastian Coe, who is a famous Olympian, behind it, and we really sold Britain. And one of the key things that was promised was all around sustainability. We promised the greenest games ever. We promised to take a, a very poor part of arguably the, the, the world's most fantastic city and regenerate it in a way that was fit for purpose for the future. We agreed to create a legacy that would last 100 years and make a really positive difference. And we won for all sorts of reasons, but those commitments and those promises were what really helped seal the win for the Games. Anyway, so there were all this jubilation and celebration. And then, and then we came back, the team came back, and then you're faced with a very daunting task of delivering a massive infrastructure projects and a brilliant event in London 2012. And although the bid document and the glamour and the glitz around the presentation on promising the most sustainable games looked really good, it felt really good, it sounded really good, it was an inspiring story, when you dug in underneath it and looked at how you'd actually do it and what it meant and how it would be validated and how it would generally be, by fact, the greenest most sustainable games ever, was rather thin. 
You know, there wasn't very much content. Nobody had promised that before. Beijing in 2008 had done well, but nobody had really committed to this thing. There was no um, event plan. There was no other strategy. There was no other experience which had really focused on this thing as a priority. So when you organize these events, there are nearly always two, two entities. There's one entity set up which is about creating the infrastructure for the event. And then there's usually an event thing, an event organization that runs the event. So you two being together, actually, you know, the types of things you're focusing on and doing and the types of things you're focusing on joining, when you're running big events, they fit together. And usually what you would do and what you would deliver is then handed over for you guys to pick up and make work. So, so at the beginning, in, in just before 2006, so six years before the Olympics, an organization was set up called the Olympic Delivery Authority. And another one was set up called the London, London Organising Committee for the Olympic Games. So every single Olympics has an OCOG. We had LOCOG, there was BOCOG for Beijing, etc. LOCOG put on the show. So I, I was brought in to work for the Olympic Delivery Authority and my prime role at the beginning was to help shape up and create the content, the strategy, the targets, the way of doing that genuinely delivered the greenest games ever. And so I joined them in early 2006. I joined them part-time, seconded from my other job, really to try and create this thing. And, and we had to get straight on with it. And I have to say, when I, um, when I joined, or when I was asked to join, it sort of came out, it was let be known that I would join, I would join the Olympic Games and the Olympic Delivery Authority and do work on sustainability. And in about the first 10 days, I got 150 people wrote to me or emailed me or called me up. And 141 of the 150 contacts said, don't do it. This is a big infrastructure project. It's in Britain. It's going to be a disaster. We'll deliver late. People will die. <laughs> the unions will go on strike and hold you to ransom. It's going to be a nightmare, and we'll be embarrassed in front of the world. And nobody, if you're asked to do the green stuff, nobody's going to take you seriously, because they're going to be so worried with fixing strikes and getting things done, um, that they won't have any time for the green stuff. And anyway, the green stuff will get all too expensive and it will happen. Nine wrote to me and said, go for it. But anyway, I, um, my, my original living was as a cyclist. I was an athlete. I went to the Worlds. I never went to the, I wasn't an Olympian. I was a national champion and world championship competitor, not an Olympian. I'd coached the ladies triathlon team for Athens. So I, I was a bike coach for Athens. I went out as a coach. And here was an opportunity to have a go at building a games on a topic I'm passionately caring about, which is sustainability in its broadest sense, in my favorite city in the world, in London. So despite the 141, I went with a nine. I mean, what they said, of course, is they all finish off by saying, and by the way, if you do do it, um, BRE, the company I worked for, has had it, because its reputation will be solid, and your career is toast. You'll never get another job again. So they don't, just, they don't just say the disaster thing, they personalise it. <laughs> but I thought, well, you've got to give this a go. What an opportunity. Anyway, so I joined the Olympic Delivery Authority. And, and really, actually, nobody had done what we did. And we were all really worried. How on the earth do you do this project? How do you deliver? You can't be late for the Olympics. You know, we had a very tight budget. And uh, how can you do that? Nobody had done it. How the hell do you do it? So the boss, a chap called David Higgins, who is now the chair of High Speed 2, who ran Network Rail afterwards as well, he, he got the senior team together, the commercial, the design director, the lawyer, the HR director, sustainability, and other <coughs> construction director, and said, right, we don't know how to do this project. Nobody's done a project like this before. Nobody has the experience. We've got things we can pick up on, but we've got to do this. And he set five priorities. He said, the first thing is, the first priority is by far, is everybody on our project goes home alive and uninjured every night. And you might think that's an odd thing to ask for first, but prior to this, every single Olympic Games that's been built has killed people. Every Olympic Games since, which is one, is it? Has killed people. So our top priority was not to kill anybody and was that everybody went home to their loved ones every night uninjured. And that was by far the most important priority. And in fact, culturally, that brought a culture across a whole project in 20,000 people that meant we all cared for each other. 
were your focus, people's voices counted, people were taken notice of. And that was one of the biggest enabling cultural parameters for the project. That was one thing. The second thing is we're going to deliver on time. It would be very embarrassing not to be ready for the opening ceremony when billions of people around the world are looking in. The third thing is we're going to make our budget. We're not going to exceed our budget. Um, we're not going to exceed it. And the fourth thing is, in a very litigious sector, which is construction, and especially on a project like that, we're not going to have rework, we're not going to have litigation, we're not going to have unions working off-site. And the fifth thing, we're going, to, we're going to work out what green targets are, sustainability targets are, and we're going to do them. But then he said, but we don't know how to do it. There's no experience about doing this. And what we've got to do is we've got to adopt a culture whereby rather than boxing in and prescribing how these things are done, we've got to connect with people, we've got to ask some questions, we've got to think about and innovate on how we might do these things. We've then got to nail them in process and procurement, those stuff. And then we've got to start building, and we've got to build and design and all of that um, in a way where you learn by doing, so you continually improve. You recognise the fact that you can't fix and box things in because things are bound to change. And you've got to have a culture of learning. And if you have a culture of learning and improvement, then you're most likely to deliver it. So that's how it started, really. And I was there. I just couldn't believe it. I'd, been, I'd ridden there on my bike before the meeting. I'd sat in front of the Canary Wharf. We, we took two floors of the Barclays Tower in Canary Wharf. It was a sunny day. I remember sitting on a bench by one of the canals with my bike alongside. I was listening to um, Coldplay, one of those sort of musical inspiring songs, looking up at this thing thinking, wow, I'm going to work on the Olympics. I'm going to the 22nd floor. I'm going to get involved in sustainability on this project. And then suddenly I was there. Anyway, I tell that story because that was really, really important and that, that sort of impacted how it worked. So the first thing we did is you're planning, right? Well, this is and was and is the biggest planning application ever made in Europe. It was for a huge part of London. Um, it was a really difficult site. It had to go to European level for planning permission. It was really, really tough. And these types of projects, as you'll know, normally can take 10 years or 15 years in planning. We had 18 months to think about how to do this job and to get it all through the planning processes. So immediately, and it's not a choice of whether to, you have to, to get the job done. So we started the planning process. And I show this picture. This is a site. So this is a site. It's in the east of London. It had been used for about 100 years of industrial use. The ground was incredibly polluted. It was a hot potch and mishmash of buildings doing all sorts of things, industrial use. Canals there, railways there. Um, this was actually part way into the project. We, started, we had 240 buildings there at the beginning. This was after they'd been knocked down. But we had to build a planning permission for this very, very big area in the east of London. In an area, too, where, where socially, societally, people on average in that part of London die seven years earlier than if you lived here. Lots of unemployment, um, all sorts of health issues. There, it was a really quite deprived area of London uh, that desperately needed doing up. So we had to think about how do we do that and how to live the most sustainable game. So we started by thinking, well, what we've got to do here is... First of all, we think on a 100-year time horizon. So in the planning, we weren't thinking about the event. The event was six weeks of Olympics and Paralympics, which was the reason the development was happening. But in planning, we're thinking of 100 years. So the whole planning pro program was how do we create a place that's going to work for London for 100 years? But knowing that we had to do this event, so then on your event side, you, you like to, it's like being at a wedding where you've got the bride side and the groom side here, isn't it? You're all events people, you're all planning people. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway. We've got to deliver a brilliant event in the meantime. So what, what we thought about in the beginning was we wanted to make our life as easy as possible. So we built the minimum number of new venues, all of which had to have a legacy use. So we needed a main stadium. We didn't have a main stadium. That's the heart of the games. We needed a swimming pool and aquatic centre, which anyway we wanted for legacy use, for people to use, local schools to use. We needed a velodrome. In fact, one of the great bits of that site had been that there was... Um, cycle circuit that had been there for 40 years and all the local school kids used that site. And in fact, when I was a lad becoming a racing cyclist, I used to race there every Saturday. So it's quite heartrending when we dug up the place 
and brilliant when we built somewhere new. But that was a really important part of a facility for Londoners and young kids thereafter. The Olympic Village, you have to house the people, but also in that part of London there was desperate need for housing. So when we planned the Olympic Village with all the rules around it, we planned it so that you could retrofit quite quickly and build a mix of private and social housing. So social housing was 50%, private housing 50%, a nice mix. And we had to build a media centre because the world's press come there and show the games. But again, we built a media centre with a view to it becoming a place for businesses to land, to employ local people, to give them more prosperity. But there's loads of other things you have to use. You know, Olympics is not just running, swimming, cycling, living and doing media. You've got other stuff. So what we did was we looked around London and found other places already built to use them in our show. So we used Wembley. We used Wimbledon for the tennis. We used Horse Guards Parade for various events just um, you know, behind Whitehall. And we used the Dome for an array of other events. So, so the first thing we did to be green and to think about legacy was build the minimum number of events. And anything else we needed on the park, we built as temporary structures. So they were there for the games, and then they went. They all went into the planning. We got our planning which is easy to say in about 30 seconds. It was a huge task, we got that done. Anyway then, in the meantime, we were trying to work out what on the earth is a sustainability strategy. What is a sustainability strategy for the games? What do you include? What do you disclude? How do you know whether you've been successful or not? And if you go back to 2006, when people talked about sustainability, they spoke mainly about carbon, they spoke about waste, they spoke about water, they spoke about materials. Social sustainability, economic sustainability, were part of the three parts of the sustainability stall, but underdeveloped. And actually being green through environmental reasons back then was quite a challenge, much less than now. People are more used to it. Um, but our sustainability strategy had these main headlines in, and the carbon, water, waste and materials targets we set were really important. But they weren't our priority. Our priorities were about access providing a place for Londoners to go and exercise, for kids to go and play, for families to feel part of a community, and to provide a great place for London. Providing employment and business, so people that are unemployed in that area stay in that area and are able to get jobs. Providing a place for health and well-being. Again, back in 2006, health and well-being as a topic was not being spoken about. Now, as people are getting older, and as our, our National Health Service is struggling, it's now become a hot topic. But I, back then it wasn't, but we really focused on that. Being inclusive, like we are at Westminster, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, you want to have a place where diversity is celebrated and you feel, you're, feel you belong. Um, transport and mobility, getting in and out of the place, is a critical part of planning somewhere. It doesn't only work for the event, but works post-games. <clears throat> But then, too, you can imagine, you're running the Olympics, everybody that has some view on sustainability wants to do it. So when it came to carbon, we had all this pressure from the national government, other governments, Greenpeace, businesses and everything, saying that this, you know, when we looked at the, the key performance indicators we'd need around carbon, our shortlist was 126. When we looked at uh, materials, there were 76 different absolutely critical must-have parameters being pressed on us to measure but you can't deliver a project like that. So we had four on carbon, we had three on materials, we had two on waste, um, which was zero waste to landfill, et cetera. And so when we, when we built this, under the, you can go online and see this strategy document, there's a narrative, there are some clear targets, there's some clear measures that went into a document that was about that thick, which is very thin for an Olympic project, and then we set about designing it and doing it. I just want to show how that works. So, Oh, and the other thing we used was... Oh, and the point about all those factors is they're like a system. You know, they're not, they're, they mutually impact on each other. You can do something around transport and have a negative effect on carbon, or you do something on transport and have a great other impact on accessibility. So you, it's like a balancing system of factors you have to think about and innovate when you're doing. The other thing we used was um, a standard called BREEAM, which is a design standard for the buildings. And what that does is that brings together the 12 different categories you think about when you're designing a green building like energy, water, waste, access, and other things. And the point of that is all the science that underpins and measures of performance there are different. But this is not a system that tells you how to measure. We said we want Bream Excellent on all our venues. It means you have to get 76 credits. 
those 12 different impact categories, depending how good you are, you get credits. And the important thing about that scheme is it gives you a system to measure performance by, and it doesn't tell you what to build, what materials to use, how it should look, or anything else. So it's like an innovation enabling system that means the client and through the supply chain can innovate to optimize the best solution. And so the innovation, uh, the sustainability strategy in its different factors in its system, and things like Bream in its system were absolute prerequisites and enablers of innovation. And again, the thing that we wanted to avoid at the beginning was knowing as a customer exactly what to do and blocking innovation and improvement, because if we'd done that, we wouldn't have delivered. Anyway, starting point is 240 buildings on the site. Knackered old buildings, been there for ages, duffed up land and all that sort of stuff. What, do you, what on the earth do you, do you do with them? And so the normal thing is you demolish them, you put them in a load of trucks, take them off site, put it in landfill or somewhere else, bring in new stuff and start again. But that isn't and didn't fit with our ethos of sustainability for the games. So what we did was we ground everyone up and we kept it on site. And the first picture I showed you, so for quite a while, the site looked like, if I go back to this one, it looked like that. Piles of brown stuff or gray stuff of different grades. And every single building stayed on site. We cleaned four million tons of soil. We dug down about two and a half meters, took out all the Japanese knotweed. And on this part of the site, we had these green machines that washed all that soil and kept it all on site. So we reused more than 98% of what was on the site in the first place. And the point about that was, um, that was actually a very difficult logistical exercise to do. But one of the things it really did was protect people's well-being off site, because we'd have had trucks going off every 30 seconds for two years to take stuff on and bring it on, take it off and bring it on, um, to program the site. That's not sustainable, that's not safe. And again, a lot of people were sceptical about that, but that's what we did. And when, if you go to the Olympic Park, all the, um, you'll see the gabions and things holding uh, waterways and bridges back. But the whole landscaping and everything is made from what was on the site in the beginning. Saved us money, saved us time, was more safe, required some innovation, but worked well. Then one of my first discussions, it must have been 10 days in, was we were on the Olympic Stadium the centerpiece of the Olympics, the thing that everybody looks in at from around the world and, and that is spectacular. And when we were doing this, the, uh, the, the main stadium in Beijing, which was just going up, so this was before 2008, was called the Bird's Nest Stadium. And if ever you've seen it, it's the most amazing looking structure. It's got 40,000 tons of steel all wrapped together like twigs in a bird's nest on this thing. Their budget was four times our budget. We couldn't afford that type of structure. But what there is with every games is a competition. So every single games has to be better than the last. It's like sport. You want to win. You want to be better. So we were sat there with a quarter of the budget the um, Chinese had, trying to outdo them on the centerpiece for the games. Anyway, and this was, this was the most encouraging moment, and it set this sort of culture. Anyway, we're having this discussion with all the boss ones, the top boss one and the others, saying, well, what do we do about this? You know, this is this thing. And, and the conversation went on events side, right? It went, well, actually, what we're doing is, this is a 100-year project that we're planning for Londoners, but what we're doing is, there's a six-week peak that's making it happen. We're putting on a show. We're putting on an event. So the conversation said, well, what do you think about events? So we started thinking about theatre. And if you go to the theatre, you know, you sit in rows of seats, you look down at a bunch of plywood lights, backdrops and other things, and say it's a, I don't know, some Elizabethan play or something, you look down, and you'll look down at the, and have the illusion of a street that isn't, or you look inside a house, and it appears to be inside a house and isn't. So, you know, that's what events, a lot of theater and events are like that. You create the illusion of something that isn't real, but it's part of the show. That's what this main stadium is. So when we thought about it, we thought, well, do you know what? We don't need, an eight, actually we have got a stadium there now that's doing football, but when we were doing this, we were actually planning for a 26,000 seater stadium because what we were thinking is that's where London, uh, that's where Athletics GB can locate itself with labs and other things. And that's not just a place where school kids and others can go and you can hold events, it's a place where you generate the Olympic champions of the future. Just like happened with cycling in the Commonwealth Games in Manchester, a velodrome was built in Manchester, 
partly to put on the event, but mostly to create the place and the science and the training and the location to create great athletes. So they said, well, we just sort of think like a theatre. So actually the main stadium is designed like a really great bit of scaffolding. So you've got these big tubes. Behind that you have temporary structures that are bolted together. You have seating around. All the seating from this level up could be unbolted and taken somewhere else. And it was like a temporary scaffolding for that. But of course you've got to make it look great. So inspired by the theatre, that thing around it isn't glass or steel, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. And the idea of the wrap was you'd produce a colourful wrapping, just like you have a backdrop on a theatre, and you'd either use light or imagery or other things to give the illusion of a main stadium when it wasn't really one. Quite brave, really. Um, so that's what, that's what happened. So just one meeting, innovating, and you come out with a solution like that. And that's where I knew I was with a team of people who were really committed to a green games and a sustainable games. But I did have a problem because 10 months in, I was asked to lead on construction products. So I looked at the procurement of concrete, steel, other materials. And one of the challenges I was given was I had to find a material that was about 800 metres long, 30 metres high, would resist bomb blast, was printable, take the wind loading, and had some sort of recycling thing. Well, I challenge any of you to find any sort of material anywhere that does that thing. So that was all, it was all very well having that innovation, but then I found myself trying to find the solution. And in fact, we couldn't. And if you look at pictures of the games, what we did in the end was we could find smaller bits of material which we erected as sails, so it sort of looked lovely, but it was a much more practical solution. But the point is, when you start that type of thinking and that type of innovation, all sorts of other things flow. So, oh, and that's the construction. And we, it, we even did things on the construction where the top pipes, so the pipes on the top structure, were actually leftovers from um, a project laying drains across Britain in the northeast. They were left over, so they're brought back to the Olympic Park, bolted and welded together, and that's the main structure. So it's just, um, the great thing was there's a sort of talk and aspiration for it, but the delivery was that type of thing. Then we had the aquatic centre, this beautiful... Um, flowing structure, drawn in a restaurant on a napkin by Zaha Hadid in the first. A brilliant, um, inspiring architect in the beginning. A complete nightmare to build. Really with difficult engineering, but looked beautiful. And she drew it in legacy mode. So there's these glass panels there are post-games, and it's a place for, for school kids, for families, and for others from London and future budding athletes to go and, 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 and national and world champions to go and exercise. No good for a Games. You need to host 17,000 people there. But that's its purpose. That was a 100-year plan. So that's what we had to build, but we had to put on a show. That was the structure. In fact, this engineering structure was just... The, the sort of software had just allowed this, and that was the type of structure that had to be built. It was really, really difficult. A great engineering challenge, but we did it. That's it. So then... We thought, well, how do we put it on the show? So what we did for the show was we built these big wings that stuck off it. So we didn't put the glass in the beginning. We built these big wings, which went way above the roof, but where we made sure the views were such that you could see down and you could see the swimming pool in an un un uninterrupted view. And they were there just for games use. But some of the detailing here, this fabric that went around it, again, was a special type of PVC, which could be reused and recycled. It didn't have the carcinogens that you normally have, the plasticizers. These steel pieces were standard lengths bolted, so they could go away on the back of a truck and be reused again. And so the main stadium was built that way, to put on a fantastic show. That's what it looked like, but also to come through into legacy use. Then my favourite, the, um, the velodrome, with its thing around, was designed. And this was, this was a little worrying, because all the other venues were being built, and this one wasn't. It hadn't been designed, it hadn't been built... We were worried about it being finished on time and that sort of thing. And, you know, a velodrome is quite a difficult structure because you have a track that's about that's two, two, 250 or 300 metres round. You need a free span of about 130 metres, and that's quite a difficult structure. If you're, you know, if you're looking at steel beams are about this high, if you're looking about concrete buildings are about that high, and wood are about as high as this room. So fabricating and building something like that with a free span structure so you have clear views is really, really difficult and very expensive, and, and actually very difficult to build safely. But what happened was, because we had a culture where people are allowed to think, 
our contractor, um, you know, and a, and a lot of building contractors are not, you know, the people that go and build things are not necessarily highly regarded. They make very low margins. Construction professionals like architects and others might look down on them as being sort of slightly grubby people who build things that they don't want to get too close to. Not all of them, but there is definitely a tone of that. Innovation within contractors has not been celebrated that much. It is being more now. Anyway, because on our project you had permission to think, um, the contractor, ISG, went off and did some research and found some of these um, cable structures, cable net roofs. And so what we decided to do was, and what the agreed outcome was to build uh, a roof for this thing. It's like a big trampoline. So what happened was, and what that meant was, it was a very lightweight structure, and it meant that all the piles on the ground were about half what you'd need normally. The superstructure, all the steel, was about 40% of what you'd need normally. And the whole construction was very safe to build because basically you built the superstructure, you tied these cables that you draped across in squares, in a grid across the um, venue, and then you cranked them up, and the whole roof lifted up. And so it was very, very safe to build, no working at height problem, things like that. And so this started last, but was built first. And this is a cable, you can see the cable grid there, and you can see these wood, lightweight wood panels coming in that are insulating, that go onto it, that make the structure work. And that's it. And it is like, um, it doesn't quite bounce when you walk on it, but it's, it's almost like that. Anyway, the other great bit of innovation, and this is where you have to think of a system, is again, every single Olympic Games, when you're running an event, you want the fastest times ever. You want to be the Olympics that generates the most Olympic records and world records. Um, as well as to have a great thing. So this is where you sort of combine physiology and other things together. And also where you can start thinking about how you bring it home for Britain a bit. So... When it comes to going fast around a track on a bicycle, wind resistance matters hugely. And the higher the temperature, the lower the wind resistance, the faster you go. So what we wanted to do with this track was we wanted to optimise and have as high as possible the temperature, the air temperature of the track, because that allowed the cyclists to go faster. But what we knew was Brits and Europeans, but especially Brits, you know, our weather here isn't that warm. So our physiology performs well up to about 28 degrees. Over about 28 degrees, some of our fellow competitors from around the world who live in warmer climes might do better. So this was optimised so that at track, at track level, the temperature was 28 degrees. And what happened was in the warm-up events and during the Games, um, we had world records, and the Brits didn't win everything. And it wasn't just the temperature, but they did very well. But the other thing that's really interesting about the design was we're thinking all about legacy use. So it's great to have the event and the world records, but legacy use, you've got to have something that's quite cheap to run. You want to reduce the operational costs. And the trouble is, is if you want to run a track and keep that temperature in, the mechanical and electrical ventilation systems can cost quite a lot to do. But what this has is these dark shadings you see are actually grooves and slots cut in the in the wall, and if you sit on the seats, if you ever go and you look underneath the seats, you'll see instead of having solid concrete supports, you have gaps. And that's called passive ventilation. So what happens is air is drawn in the bottom and goes out the top and you get a natural circulation. And that meant that the mechanical and electrical kit that went into the building was about 30% of what you'd normally use, which means now the operating costs of the venue are lower. So you end up with a beautiful structure, quickly and safely built, with world record times that's now working in legacy mode in a way that you'd wish. The, um, the Olympic Village was built, beautiful place, um, loads of green around, we called it the Green Lung, so that athletes could go, and most importantly afterwards, people from that part of London could go and have clean air, go to places where there's nature and other things, you just feel calm and like you're in the country. But when we built this too, again, we looked at sustainability standards to make sure that energy costs and other things and overheating would be minimised. But also we planned it. The Olympic um, lot, whatever they're called, the International Olympic Committee, have rules about how you lay these things out in spaces, which don't work for normal living. So we planned it so that we had a temporary fit-out of stuff in the rooms, which were immediately then converted, and the flats and things were sold. 
And then this is where we had basketball. So it's like a, a huge marquee, if you like. And again, what we did here was this was a sort of four-story structure that we built temporarily where we held, held some events. And across the park, we had an array of those things that went off and mostly have been used in other events and things going forward. And then, have, has anybody been to the Olympic Park? Yes. Yeah. Has anybody not been? Who hasn't been? Anyway, if you've been or haven't been, you've got to go. Just because the, um, I mean, it's, the buildings and everything are, want, are great, but the place, the park, is fantastic. It's got the plantings were brought, the types of flowers, the landscaping, the natural landscape, the wildlife. The place is wonderful. We designed it so carefully. You know, when we were looking at it at the beginning, there were all sorts of levels issues where you'd have places like those flyovers where drug dealers hang out. And, you know, all of that stuff, we were so careful with the design to make sure that none of those places existed and to create a place where kids and others would feel um, safe and want to go. And when you go there, I mean, it's, it's, it's adorable because there's, there's always kids running around and stuff going on and it just it feels a lovely space so so we and we worked so hard on that and the detailing of the planting and the, the use of plant we did we did all sorts of wonderful historic things like that tree out there that one over there is a plane tree so in london when we use lots of coal to um heat buildings here it produces a lot of soot and smog and plane trees were planted because they're really good at absorbing that and what we did, we, we, so that's part of London's character. So when you go to the Olympic Park, you'll see glades of um, those types of trees planted again. So you have the history and the new and the functionality together. Um, the other thing that was really powerful was procurement. So I told you I led on construction products. And this was really important because it was a key thing that drove what we bought. Money talks. So procurement means what you're going to buy. And lots of people wanted to participate in the project, partly out of pride, but partly because we were spending billions building things. But you want them to behave against those characteristics you care about, not killing people, delivering on time, not falling out with each other, coming on budget and being green. The trouble is, is you have a whole industry that doesn't know how to do that and isn't conditioned to do that and isn't required to do that. So basically what we did was we nailed that in our procurement. So if you wanted to deliver on our park, you wanted to win our work, you had to show performance against these things. And the way we did it too was we created um, a thing like eBay and internet dating called Compete4, where anything was bought that you wanted to buy went into that place, and anything you wanted to be supplied or to be bought, you put into that place. So all those sort of mate rates and favours and the stuff that goes on, for people that aren't beyond reproach and hamping, it was nuked. And it meant that the only way you could compete and supply on the games was if you went through our Compete For platform. And on that, we had a balanced scorecard of buying. So cost was important, but that important. You see the box at the end, it's about that important. Delivering on time was really important. Being safe and secure was really important. And so we generally built a balanced scorecard where people would have to upload their information and we had all sorts of ways of quantifying it. And then at the end, we chose products based on those balance of factors. And that was the most important thing that helped us enable. And what, you know what we found? So this, and this is where it sort of works. So if you think about um, equalities and inclusions, you know, we cared about that stuff, but doesn't that just cost more? Well, no, it doesn't, because what you find is, you find if you're employing companies who care about equalities and inclusions, they, um, they run their business as well. And then that means that when you're doing a project like this, they actually do what they say they're going to do when they're going to do it. So one of the normal problems that often happens in construction is where people say they're going to do something and then don't, and then ask for money to finish. We were, we were employing responsible companies run well, and it meant when they came on our project, they actually did what they say they were going to do when they were going to do it. If you drive the environment about responsible sourcing and environmental impact, you save money. Our concrete had 30% less CO2 arisings per tonne than normal concrete. It used waste material from concrete to substitute for Portland cement. That meant that the cost per tonne were lower. And what that meant was, when it came to getting the stuff in on site, we could bring it in by train. It cost a little bit more by train to unload it, but it meant 
the cost saving by reducing the CO2 arising per tonne meant we had enough money to bring it in by trains, which again helped with the logistics. Um, for about 18 months, we had trucks coming through the north site about every 90 seconds. If we'd had to bring concrete in, we had millions of tonne coming in, we'd have had a truck coming through every 45 seconds. It would have been a nightmare. So practically, we needed to come in by train. Environmentally, it was good to come in by train. So you see, there are all sorts of... Um, when you think about sustainability in its broadest sense, there are all, some things you pay more for, but a lot you don't. And then the other thing that's really... That I said this cultural thing. I just want to tell you about that. We, we, we did things. Um, when we started there, all the boss ones, like me, on our suits were given these, these big Olympic logos, which were either pink, orange, green, or blue. And not like subtle colours, I mean really bright. And the pin wasn't a little pin, it was massive. So if you're like me, sort of boss type chap, wears a suit, wearing a great big pink pin. Anyway, I sort of got used to it, but in the beginning it felt very uncomfortable. Anyway, 10 days after these pins were issued to the bosses, we found on eBay they were being sold, £100 per pin. And... Uh, and again, this was, this was just how the Olympics was. Um, rather than finding out who had leaked them, you know, and sacking somebody, we looked at where they went. And do you know who was buying them? The people that were buying them were the Gurkhas, who were so proud to work on the project, they were doing the security. So when he went on the park, they'd be sitting there in their very polite but lethally secure way with all their stuff on, and they had lanyards with a security thing. And on the lanyards, they'd have their pins. They were buying the pins. So rather than um, telling somebody off, we free issued pins to everybody. We had thousands of pins, we gave them away. And then when we worked our first million hours without a reportable accident, we had a party we celebrated with pins. After a year, we celebrated with pins. So it's quite interesting. And, and actually, if you go to sport events, if you go to any events, people collect those types of things. I did something with sustainability where we created a sustainability pin, but we, got, we didn't have designers do it, we did it ourselves. And one of the, one, the ones that won it was just one, uh, a, a nobody boss one, not a designer, who came up with an idea. And they had a round planet, the Earth's resources, a silver hand holding it by a green Olympic logo. So we had the PIM. But we didn't free issue them. We gave away 19 a month, one to eat contractor. And you could give them to anybody who um, had done something good on sustainability. The first one we gave was to the guy who was digging the drain, who... If you asked him about how to dig a drain well and didn't tell him what to do, he could do it better. So he found a way of digging faster with 30% less waste, better for safety, better for sustainability. We gave him first pin. Second pin we gave to Jamie, who ran the yard for the handball court, because he had two months without any waste going to landfill. He controlled what came in and what came out. Um, worked really well. I met um, the mayor. We had this mayor, Boris Johnson. And... I was at some event or other in um, the mayor's place, and it wasn't anything to sustainability. And um, anyway, in the questions at the end, he was asked by some sort of slightly cynical hack, was this really going to be the greenest games ever? And he spoke for about eight minutes, and it was absolutely clear his, he got nearly all his facts wrong. <laughs> but it didn't matter because his commitment as mayor of London to the greenest games was unequivocally strong. Anyway, on his way out, I was at the back, on his way out, you know, he said sort of, do it for London, and do it for London, or whatever he said, motivating talk. Anyway, I gave him a pin, because he wasn't a contractor, but he deserved a pin. That week, there was going to be some tube strike or other. He was on the news, different suit, wearing his pin. Politics show on the Monday, wearing his pin. No, on the Sunday, wearing his pin. David Cameron, I met the Prime Minister on something entirely different. Um, gave him a pin, although <laughs> I'm not sure he's committed as Jamie, but anyway, he was clearly there. He, he went on the Monday to turn on the Olympic lights, and I got a little note from him after saying, very proud to wear my pin. And this, this story here, I like this story. So this, this, is, this is constructing the, um, the velodrome. And I came here in my suit with my immaculate protective gear and everything like that. And you see those two chaps there. I, um, I asked them what they're doing. And what they're doing, actually, is, is quite simple. Is they've got bits of wood, they've got a hammer, and they've got nails, and they're nailing thousands of pieces of Siberian pine onto the thing to make the velodrome. You know, and when you're on a park and you're like a suit and you're the customer, people can be um, 
can use their sort of humour or slight belligerence to make the most of the moment. But they didn't. When I asked them, um, what are you doing? You know, they could have said, well, what does it look like I'm doing a suit? I've got a hammer, I've got a nail. But they didn't. The first guy said, we're building the fastest track in the world. And the second guy said, yeah, and it's the first track ever that's using sustainably sourced wood. So this is the first track. The designer is an Australian called Ron Webb, who was about 75. He was really resistant to doing that. But at the end, when he realised he'd built the first track ever with wood that had full chain of custody. And it's just that sort of, um, that sort of pride and emotion thing and that ability to innovate that made the most difference. And they're two of the team as well. Oh, that's the, um, just by way of interest, that's the structure of the velodrome. Oh, you see those concrete bits? You know, I was telling you about the seats you sit on. You see those slots? They're the slots that allow the air to flow. Anyway, they're just two of the team from the... Um... The other thing that worked really well was the team that were on, on site, um, nearly all our environmental champions, sustainability champions, were women aged between 22 to 32. You know, who in a man's world of contracting just don't belong. But they were brilliant, and they had all sorts of ways. They got the topic, they were really passionate about it, they had all sorts of ways of, of doing it. And the sort of things that used to happen there, I remember, was it that project, another project, I remember going, and the constructors just weren't taking the environmental side seriously enough. So I was a customer from the Olympic Authority. I, I met them, I put them through hell in a sort of polite but unrelenting way because they weren't meeting the targets. I said I was going to come back in two weeks and I wanted to see how they performed. And we sat there, and one of, the, one of the people around the table was the environmental manager, who they'd, who's about 22, a woman, had been completely ignored. Anyway, when I left, it's very scary when a customer's coming to say they're going to come back and they're going to check you out because you're not performing well enough. They didn't have a clue what to do. So when I left, this young woman working on the site said it completely changed. They all looked at me. They said, what the hell do we do? And then over the next two weeks, she helped them work out what to do. And after that, she became the person that was making them do the green stuff and actually gave some of the, the, the proudest stories of the project. So that was quite an interesting thing, that bit of diversity on the project. Not all women, but mainly women, young women, working in a man's world to make this thing happen worked really, really well. So a lot of it was just the psychology. And then, of course, we finished. Um, so if I look at the outcomes, so the outcomes were... Six years later, nobody had died. Everybody went home on our project every night. Fantastic. The number one thing. We actually finished a year early. So Lowcock, who put on the show, practised for a year before the event, a year early. We came in under our budget. We had no litigation of fallout, and we met or exceeded all our green and sustainability outcomes. And you go there now, some six, seven years on, and it is the most fantastic park in London. People who lived there we've, have managed to stay there. Um, it has gone up in value. There are new ones that have gone in, but it's really quite a, a brilliant example of how, how things can be done. And then, of course, the show, when the people came on and put on the show, they picked up from the, confid from the confidence we got, and we had all sorts of wonderful outcomes in the show. And the thing... The thing that was the best thing for me, and most surprising thing for me, was right at the beginning, um, I'd seen these CGI images of what the part looked like. And when I went in the games, it looked just like it. It was exactly the same, almost. But what it didn't do was give the feeling. You know, and uh, it was the feeling thing. When you went there, you felt what it was like to be in a brilliant event, organised in London, in a sustainable way, by volunteers. It was just the most spectacular thing, so... Anyway, there you go. There's some insights. I hope that was... What are we doing? I'll stop there. But for you guys, I hope that's relevant to planning. Hmm? And for event people, I hope it's event... <coughs> yeah, any questions or anything like that? You can have the microphone. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think it was one of the most amazing events I've seen. Yeah. Uh, being a sports fan and sports fanatic, I loved every single bit of it. Yeah. And the, the fact that I was able to be part of it and to attend a few games yeah. was amazing. But 
one thing that I really, I won't forget is seeing the ring logo of the Olympics down on the canal in Canary Wharf. Oh, yeah. Was at work and then all of a sudden to see the colors going up and down yeah. was an amazing, amazing moment and thinking, yeah. oh, this is real, this is really happening. Yeah. So for that and all the feelings that you created yeah. before and after the event was amazing. Yeah, it was, yeah. And it's such a privilege to be part of. Oh, amazing. I had a lot of friends that actually volunteer and they got jobs. Yeah. The, 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 um, one of the things was, it was so beyond reproach mm. that even though I'd spent, I felt, six years killing myself on this wonderful project and so many others, when it came to ticketing, there was no favouritism. Really? So we all had to, you know, and I, I got really close to not being able to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I experienced one day and it was, you know, it was, as you say, amazing, amazing thing, yeah. And being part of it, does it mean that you had uh, lots of free tickets or like the no, rest of us had to queue up on No favoritism at all. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that was something that I was a bit annoyed. I wanted to see so many sports. So did I. I was only able to see two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm near, I'm from where the Olympic oh, yeah. Games and Stratford is. I, I was born and raised in Upton Park. Yeah. And growing up, it really revolutionised Stratford. Yeah. But in my opinion, I think although the Games is a really positive thing for the community, yeah. an issue is um, the gentrification of the area. And That's the fact the that if you can't... Um, if, you, if you don't fall into the social housing bracket, but then you're not from a family where yeah. wealth is opulent, you can't afford to live there. No. So how do you think, if you could, how would you kind of try and change or adapt or influence the local government or the mayor of London or anyone to kind of change that scope? Yeah. So that is a real... That was the risk. And that... <laughs> no. And... Um, it's bound to happen. You know, you've got Westfield, you've got a brilliant park, you've got amazing sport venues, people want to go there, values are bound to go up. And the problem with that is, you then exclude the very people that you're trying to support with there. So, what the local boroughs did, and are doing, and what was done on the park, was to, was around social housing primarily. So, by making sure there was social housing provision, that was one way. But the other thing is, it's almost impossible, I think. I, don't, I, really, I really don't know the answer to the question. I don't really know what more you can do for the private sector market, um, where you're trying to get people who aren't in social housing to be able to afford things. I really don't know how you can control that in a way. And it, it sort of hasn't been controlled in a way. It's really difficult to do that. I think the only way of, the only way of making sure things stay is through social housing provision and those types of things. But otherwise, I, I haven't got a magic wand or solution. Inevitably, house prices have, ri have risen. Um, but, or and, the good thing is, is the social housing provision is still there and there's still an ethos of trying to protect that in the area. So, but that's the problem with development everywhere and planning everywhere, is you do it for good reasons and then you create a place which some years down the line loses the whole purpose of why it was there in the beginning. Because it's, defi it's definitely noticeable. Like it is noticeable. A two-bedroom flat is over five hundred thousand pounds. Yeah. So for someone like me, I ju that, that's just no. I just that's ridiculous. You know, it's yeah. just not feasible. No. But I think more good came from it than bad. Yeah. Oh, more good than bad, definitely. But uh, <coughs> but that's a really difficult thing to socially engineer and work out. Yeah. Any other questions? Right. Any other? I'll right. Be. Hang on, hang on. I think we can probably take a couple, two more, I think. You've got the lead at one, haven't you? Well, I'm, yeah, we'll, we'll finish at one, yeah. 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 Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I had a question in terms of um, how were the lessons shared from this uh, Olympics game in London? Were they passed on to Brazil? Because there were a lot of challenges with the Olympic yeah. Games and you know, the construction of what was happening yeah. to communities in Brazil. Yeah. Some, but not much. <laughs> so I, I went to Brazil. I met Dilma, I met the President there and various others and uh, talked about it and so some lessons passed but not many, not enough. What did happen was a lot of the lessons passed to our projects, so Crossrail, HS2, um, High Speed 2, other big infrastructure projects, a lot of the people that were employed on the games moved to those projects. So in Britain, you know, Crossrail, Crossrail has done really well, um, one person died which is really sad. Uh, so that stayed in Britain, 
and, and a lot of British companies have exported on the back of their successes on the games. But Brazil is such a different culture and way of doing and so different that there was relatively little passing on. In China, what happened with China was that worked quite well. It's like we learned a bit from the Chinese, we took that forward and engaged with the Chinese and then Britain has gone back to take the learning back into China. So there's quite a lot of, um, been quite a lot of exchange both ways with China. Um, and and I, I went on missions with our last Prime Minister, I met their Premier, he came to Britain and quite a lot of stuff's happened since, but not with Brazil so much. And who knows what's going to happen in Brazil now? After the elections last week, yeah. One last question. Yeah. Well, it's sort of similar to the young lady's question about gentrification. Yeah. And um, it has more to do with what policy concerns were, were sort of given to value capture of the area. Was it something that was considered in terms of as the land value increases, how would you be able to, to capture some of that value to put back into the area? Yeah. Um, it's probably an unfair question. It's not unfair. No, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. So not a lot is the answer, not a lot of that. Um, we, some things were done that were positive. So for example, but not, not enough, but some things were done. So one of the things we were looking to build was a ruddy great windmill to do renewable energy. Uh, but when we looked at it, we worked out that there was a better way. So we took the millions that we were gonna do with that. We added it to the mayor's fund and we put energy efficiency into a bunch of homes and schools around the boroughs. So if you like, that's a way of, so they could run their buildings cheaper and they could employ more teachers to teach kids. So there are some things like that. But there will, of course, be revenues back in development that goes to the local boroughs that will help them further develop for, for more better social needs. So some of that will come through. But you know, when we were planning the project and the event, the boroughs were probably doing a bit of that and hoping for a bit of that, but it wasn't core to our, our efforts within the ODA. There was um, a company that was set up, others called, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like a legacy company who looked at some of that. But it wasn't hugely in the planning we did on the way. But hopefully now, yeah, there's some disbenefits and some benefits will impact the area. Anyway, I'll finish. You've been very good listeners. Thank you very much. <laughs>